So the, the topic that I'm going to talk about is, is joint health and uh, sort of discussing uh, uh, how to keep yourself healthy, what, uh, what the treatments can be when they're not, and how you can access care at, here at Markham Stovall. So I thought I'd start out with what's an orthopedic surgeon, because I get asked that all the time when I'm out at social events. Oh, you're an orthopedic surgeon, what do you do? Well, we are, we're surgical specialists focused on the surgical treatment of diseases and trauma affecting the bones, joints, muscles, and ligaments of the body. So we fix broken bones, we fix torn ligaments, we deal with bone and muscle tumors, and we replace worn out joints or treat and replace worn out joints. That, by the way, is Dr. Koo busy at work in the operating room. I thought I'd also, because most of what we're focused on tonight is knee and hip replacement, I'd go over the anatomy a little bit so that you'd understand what we're talking about and it would, it would make it a little bit more relevant for you. So this is a knee. At the top is the thigh bone or the femur and the lower end is the tibia or lower leg bone. And the white area here is the surface cartilage of the joint or what we call articular cartilage. Think of it like a Teflon coating covering the bone. It's thick, it's durable, and it's very smooth. In between the joints, or the bones rather, of the knee, there's another type of cartilage called the meniscus. And that's the one that everybody refers to when they say they've torn a cartilage. They've torn the meniscus. It is cartilage, it's a different type of cartilage to articular cartilage, and it's a different structure altogether. And here's another picture showing the thigh bone above the lower leg bone and the kneecap in the front. This kneecap has been flipped up. This is a simple drawing of a hip. And a hip is the, the femur or, low, or upper thigh bone connecting or articulating with the pelvis. And again, you see the bluish white shiny cartilage that coats the bone. That again is articular cartilage or the Teflon coating of the joint. And they don't show it on this picture, but it also lines the socket of the hip joint. Around the margin of that socket is a rim of a different type of cartilage called the labrum. And you may hear talk about torn labrums as being pathology that can occur in the hip joint. So what's arthritis? Well, arthritis is a big catch-all term describing a joint disorder featuring inflammation. There are over 100 types of arthritis. The symptoms usually include stiffness, pain, swelling, warmth, and redness. They can be due to inflammation, uh, secondary to metabolic abnormalities, things like gout and pseudogout, or due to immune problems like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. And all of those inflammatory uh, immune type diseases are usually treated by medical joint specialists or rheumatologists. If and when the disease gets to the point where it's no longer amenable to medical treatment, often the rheumatologist will send patients over to orthopedic surgeons for surgical treatment of end-stage rheumatoid arthritis or end-stage gouty arthritis. The larger area of arthritis that we end up seeing is degenerative arthritis, or what some people call wear and tear arthritis. Arthritis that occurs over time because your, knee, your, your joints get worn out. That's known as osteoarthritis. It's the most common type of arthritis in the body. It affects many, many joints and involves wear and tear damage to that joint surface cartilage, the articular cartilage, or Teflon coating that I mentioned on the end of the bones. So this picture over here shows a uh, the end of the femur, the knee, with the articular cartilage obviously damaged in several areas, secondary to osteoarthritis. Normally that cartilage, as I mentioned, is firm and smooth over the end of the bones, but when it becomes arthritic, it becomes roughened and often the wear can result in the bone becoming exposed. And if that happens on two adjacent surfaces, 
you can end up with bone on bone rubbing or articulation, which obviously is a cause of pain, a cause of stiffness, and loss of movement. This can develop relatively quickly in some patients, but often comes on slowly over years and can be initiated or hastened by injury or trauma, fractures, or by infection. So how do you prevent arthritis? How do you stop from getting it? Well, there's no definite way to prevent it. You can reduce your risk. Um, you can't change your family history or your, or your gender, which in some cases of arthritis is a factor, but you can certainly help with the amount of load that any joint, that's per particularly the lower extremity joints, are bearing by maintaining a healthy weight. You can maintain flexibility. Now this, to some people, may seem a little paradoxical. I did say that osteoarthritis is quote-unquote wear and tear arthritis. So some people would think that moving the joints around a lot might wear them out. In fact, moving joints is healthy for joints. The nutrition of a joint relies on the fluid that the joint produces circulating around inside the joint and giving nutrients to the cartilage cells. And if you're not moving, and if you start to lose movement, that circulation of fluid or synovial fluid, as it's known, is impeded and the nutrition to the cartilage is lost. So the chances of having cartilage break down is greater if you're not moving and if you're not maintaining your flexibility and mobility. So hence, we've got this fellow here who's working on his, his uh, stretches. You do, however, want to avoid repetitive trauma to the joint. So if you're engaged in sports, wear appropriate protective wear. And probably if you're starting to get achy, worn out lower extremity joints, time to hang up the, the running cleats and your aspirations for running a marathon. That's repetitive trauma to a joint. And a lot of people will ask me, is there a, is there a diet that I can have that is healthy, that it's going to uh, make my joints better. And really, there is no joint-specific diet that I can point you to, but what I can say is that eating smart choices, you know, lo low in, in simple carbohydrates, uh, lots of vegetables, um, basically a diet that's going to keep your, your weight at optimum weight is the best choice to maintain healthy joints. Having said that, there are some foods that have been shown over time to be somewhat helpful with inflammation. Um, and I, uh, many of these are listed on the Arthritis, Arthritis Society website. Uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cabbages, or the cruciferous vegetables, um, have been shown to help slow cartilage damage due to OA in mice. Whether it works in uh, humans is yet to be, be shown. Uh, fatty fish are loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. That's healthy for your joints. Um, garlic, tart cherries, turmeric. A lot of people have heard of turmeric. Um, it has been shown to decrease pain and stiffness in arthritis to some degree. And vitamin C is an antioxidant, which uh, is helpful in maintaining healthy body tissue. But you have to remember not to take more than 65 to 85 milligrams per day in your diet or in supplements because it can be a, a, uh, or can lead to the development of kidney stones if you take too much. So this is where some of the pearls come in for, from my perspective for you to take home. How do we diagnose arthritis? Well, part of it is the history. How did it come on? Was it gradual or did you have a quick sudden event during a sporting uh, dur during a game of, uh, that you were playing, or uh, did you trip over something and twist your knee? We then look at you. We, a good physician should put their hands on you and physically examine you uh, to help diagnose the problem. They may do some blood tests if they suspect that you've got an inflammatory or autoimmune disease, and they should do x-rays. And I would suggest to you that if you go to your family doctor and you're worried about arthritis, particularly in your knees, you suggest to them, politely, tactfully, that the x-ray should be standing. They should be weight-bearing. Because that tells 
us as orthopedic surgeons a lot more about the state of the, of the cartilage thickness that's left in your joints than an x-ray with you lying down on a table with no pressure on your joints. So standing or weight-bearing x-rays are very helpful. An MRI, it's obviously it's the latest technology. It is not a first-line test for diagnosing arthritis. I see so many patients who come to me who've had MRIs done and never had an x-ray done. You should always have an x-ray done first. We can often get a lot more information from an x-ray than we can from an MRI when it comes to diagnosing and assessing arthritis. If you're over, under 50 and your onset was sudden, associated with an injury, yes, an MRI is a reasonable thing to do because now we're looking at meniscal injuries or ligament injuries. But if this is a chronic problem that's been coming on over some time, it's aches and pains that are getting worse and worse, an MRI is not the first thing you should be asking for, and maybe not even indicated at all. And diagnostic ultrasound, which seems to be becoming more and more common in the assessment of painful knees, is very limited in its usefulness. It is never going to tell an orthopedic surgeon that there's something in a joint that needs surgery. If that is something that your physicians are sending you off for, you may want to discuss that with them, again, tactfully, because the only thing that I think an, an ultrasound is good for is assessing whether there is a, um, a fluid-filled structure in, uh, around your knee, like a cyst, or whether there, or if you're trying to assess a, a lump or a, a mass and trying to decide whether it's solid or, uh, or fluid filled. It isn't something we should be using for evaluating whether you've got arthritis or not, or whether you've got torn ligaments or not, or whether you've got a torn meniscus or not. Here's an example of standing x-rays showing how you can see quite nicely the narrowing of the joint that occurs under, under load. And here's another example. Again, it, this is a very simple old test, plain x-rays, taken standing, and it's probably the best thing we can get to evaluate your arthritic knees. And here's an x-ray of an arthritic hip. This is a normal hip, a nice round ball. You can see the space in there where the cartilage lives, we call it a sp space. It's not really a space at all, it's occupied by cartilage. When the cartilage wears away, the space disappears and the bones are touching bones. So how do we treat arthritis? Weight loss is the number one thing. If you're carrying around an extra 25, 50, 100 pounds on a, on a worn out joint, the first and best thing you can do is lose weight. Exercise, with the help of a physiotherapist or otherwise, to increase joint range of motion and strengthen your muscles. So you'll notice we're not talking about any sort of intervention yet. Compression and icing are sometimes helpful for swelling. There is no evidence that copper bands or magnets do anything. Don't waste your money. Bracing can be helpful. There are some patients who have painful knees on one side who find that with specific activities, let's say playing hockey, cutting the grass, playing golf. They get pain in their knee. They can live with it the rest of the time, but when they do those things, that knee kills. Using a brace to offload or put pressure off that part of the knee for that specific activity is useful. If you have pain with everything you do, a brace isn't going to help you. You're not going to put on a brace the moment you get out of bed and take it off when you go back to bed and wear it all day long. It will drive you crazy. But bracing does have use when pain is intermittent. Oral medications like Tylenol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, the Motrins, the Advils, or the prescription anti-inflammatories, and sometimes dietary supplements. Narcotics should not be a treatment for osteoarthritis. Then there's joint injections. There are some injections that are helpful. And there is, finally, and last on the list, is surgery. I've listed some dietary supplements here briefly, uh, primarily to talk about glucosamine and chondroitin. There have been some 
rudimentary studies that have shown some modest benefit. But in 2012, the American Academy of Rheumatology came out with a position statement not recommending its use for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Uh, you may have ha heard of capsaicin. It's a, it's a rub um, derived from pepper, which can help to block your uh, appreciation of pain from an arthritic joint. And then there are a couple more down here that I've listed that may have some, some benefit in the use uh, for the control of pain from arthritis. What about injections? Well, there's three types of injections that we can, actually four, but three that, that we can use. The first one is corticosteroids or cortisone injections. They're an anti-inflammatory, a steroid. They can help suppress the inflammation in a joint. The problem is that frequent use may lead to damaging the cartilage as opposed to actually helping you. Hyaluronic acid or HA, otherwise known as lubricant or gel injections, can help to lubricate the joint and improve mobility and reduce pain. It can actually help to give the cartilage that's still in the joint a little bit more resilience, a little bit more sponginess. Platelet-rich plasma injections have become uh, more mainstream for the treatment of osteoarthritis in recent years. Originally designed for treatment of sporting injuries, ligament injuries, a few years ago we started to try it in arthritis and there is now some evidence that it does give benefit not only to reduce some of the inflammatory response to arthritis but also potentially to decrease the rate or maybe even stop the loss of cartilage from osteoarthritis for a period of time. One recent study showed that at a year, the reduction in pain level from the use of platelet-rich plasma was 80% compared to placebo, which is fairly significant. I put stem cell injection in the bottom here because it's being done here in Canada and in the States quite frequently and or, in, or in a number of places. Uh, there is not yet what we call level one evidence to support it. It's expensive and I wouldn't recommend people uh, putting their hard-earned dollars into this until there's proof it works. Um, and you know maybe that proof is around the corner but certainly it doesn't exist yet. And that's a, this is a comparison of the different types of injection. Uh, they go up in cost. Uh, cortisone cannot be repeated often. Hyaluronic acid can be repeated, costs some, often covered by drug plans. Platelet-rich plasma, usually not covered by drug plans because it's a procedure um, and may have longer lasting benefits than, than the other two. So what about surgery? This is sort of the final area that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first is arthroscopy. Um, an arthroscopy is a procedure where we stick a scope, which is about the diameter of an average pen, into your knee, has a camera on the end, allows us to inspect the joint throughout. We can look at all the things that are wrong. Historically, we have used it to treat arthritis by kind of shaving away this loose cartilage that we find when we get in there. Evidence is coming now to suggest that that's probably not worth doing. What we are using arthroscopy to do is deal with torn cartilage, or torn, sorry, meniscus, or to deal with torn ligaments and to repair them, and sometimes to deal with traumatic damage to areas of the articular cartilage. But generally, wear and tear type arthritis or osteoarthritis, there is a very diminishing role for the use of arthritis in the treatment of that problem. The second type of surgery is joint preservation surgery where we can graft cartilage cells into defects. It often is associated with doing a procedure called an osteotomy. An osteotomy means we cut the bone, shift the bone to a new position to change the transfer of weight across the joint to protect the area where we're preserving or repairing. And when we put the cartilage cells in there, we hope that they will grow and mature into new joint surface cells. It isn't really yet at a stage where we can do this for a worn out joint. What we can do it for is areas where 
there is very focal localized damage either due to trauma or due to very localized disease affecting the joint surface. When it's disease over a large area, unfortunately, this is not a viable treatment. And then we talk about joint replacement. This is a, a picture of a model of a knee replacement. And what it really is is a retread of the joint. We're taking away what's left of the articular cartilage, the Teflon coating. We're trimming it away. We're reshaping the ends of the bones. And then we're putting a new artificial surface in its place. And generally speaking, that artificial surface has approximately the sh same shape and, and, and contours as what we take away. So this, as I said, is a knee. It can be a partial replacement in the knee often. We can replace parts that are worn out and leave parts that aren't worn out. And the technology that we have available today suggests that joint replacements are likely to last 20 years or more. When I trained, when I came out into practice, I used to tell my patients, I'm going to show you, you know, I think you need a knee replacement and it's probably only going to last you 10 or 15 years and then we're going to have to talk about doing it again because it's going to wear out. In point of fact, many of those patients are lasted 20 or 25 years with those types of joint replacements I was putting in back in 1990. Now, the bearing surfaces that we have available to us if we take those materials that they're made out of and we put them into a lab on a wear machine and we put them through millions of cycles of movement under load at body temperature with joint fluid all around them, they last 20 times longer than the materials that we had back in 1990. So we're hoping, we haven't got the proof yet, we're hoping that the materials we're putting in now are going to last much longer than the materials we used all those years ago. So here's a picture of a hip replacement, uh, well, an arthritic hip, an x-ray of a hip replacement, and this is a, 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 a bone, what we call it a sawbone model of what a hip replacement looks like. There's a stem that goes down inside the thigh bone, a round metal, or it could be ceramic ball, that articulates inside a socket that we've put into the pelvis. And the socket usually has a metal outer and then a plastic inner. And the plastic is something called polyethylene, which in this day and age is highly cross-linked, highly durable. A knee replacement, I've shown you the x-ray before, this is, or sorry, I've shown you the saw bones before, and this is the x-ray of what it looks inside, like inside the body. And as I said, it can be partial. This has been done for somebody who had just arthritis on the back of their kneecap rubbing over the front of the thigh bone. This part of the knee was relatively normal. Again, this is a partial knee replacement, an Oxford partial knee replacement. Dr. Hyder at our institution is our specialist in doing Oxford replacements, which can be done for select patients who have localized disease and the rest of the knee is in good shape. So if you are a person who ends up after all of this needing a joint replacement. How do you access this? The first thing you do is you have your primary care physician or primary care, primary care giver send a request either to a surgeon's office for a consultation or more appropriately now if they, if they are highly suspicious that a joint replacement is required to the Central Lynn's Centralized Referral Center which is actually located here at Markham Stovall Hospital. We run the intake center for the entire Lynn. If, you, if you, your family physician or primary care physician is requesting your care to be at Markham Stovall Hospital, or if you as a patient want to come to see a surgeon at Markham Stovall Hospital, then you will be triaged to the Markham Stovall Orthopedic and Joint Assessment Center. When that referral is, re is received in our Joint Assessment Center intake, within two weeks, our goal is that you will be seen by an advanced practice assessor who is a physio advanced practice physiotherapist. They will see you, they will evaluate you, 
They will educate you on what a joint replacement involves, and they will make an arrangement for you to see one of the joint surgeons here at Markham Stovall. And our goal is that you will be seen by the surgeon within a month. If it is decided mutually between you and your surgeon that indeed you're going to go ahead with a joint replacement of some sort, our goal is no later than six months from that date you will have your surgery and currently we're running much faster than that. As uh, Dr. Ku suggested, we are the second fastest hospital in the province getting patients in for their joint replacement and the fastest in the GTA. So that ends my uh, presentation.